Okay, this is George Abdenor again. In the first part of this talk, we talked about uh, normal variance, normal chest, normal variance, and TTN, basically. This is to continue with the medical diseases. I'm going to talk briefly about hyaline membrane disease, which next to TTN is probably the most common cause for neonatal respiratory distress that we see. Uh, this is a, a premature baby that we would read as mild hyaline membrane disease. There's just a very fine granularity noted throughout both lungs. Again, notice the lungs are symmetrically involved. Uh, there are a few air bronchograms, but not many. So this would qualify for what we call mild hyaline membrane disease. But I'll again remind you of the caveat that congenital pneumonia and hyaline membrane disease can virtually look identical on x-ray, except if you see pleural effusion. Hyaline membrane disease obviously should never have a pleural effusion. Neonatal pneumonia, especially if it's beta streph, the most common organism, may have a pleural effusion. This is another patient with hyaline membrane disease, maybe a little bit more significant involvement. Maybe you see a little bit more in the way of air bronchograms, but the cardiac and the diaphragmatic margins are still fairly well seen. So we would still probably call this a mild hyaline membrane disease. Okay, as, as the severity of hyaline membrane disease increases, you see actually less granularity. You see more in the way of air bronchograms, and you start to see obliteration of the diaphragmatic and cardiac mediastinal margins, and that's, that's the, the case in this patient. We would probably call this moderate hyaline membrane disease. It's a very artificial classification, uh, but it sort of correlates with how, how sick the baby is clinically, how high oxygen tension they, they require, how high pressure they require. Uh, so again, this will be a moderate hyaline membrane disease. This is a patient that we would call severe hyaline membrane disease. If you notice, there's no granularity anymore. It's just a diffuse opacification. The density of the lungs is almost the same as the density of the soft tissues. But you see more in the way of air bronchograms. You lose the diaphragmatic and cardiac mediastinal margins. So this is severe hyaline membrane disease. There's another patient, also a premature baby, with diffuse opacification of the lungs. There's a slight granularity there, but again, you see more air bronchograms. You don't see the cardiac, mediastinal, and diaphragmatic margins. Severe hyaline membrane disease, but don't ever forget, it can always be pneumonia. Usually the neonatologist has some clinical suspicion when a patient has pneumonia, such as premature rupture of membranes in the mother or uh, uh, CBC changes that may point to sepsis. Okay, moving on to another fairly common medical disorder as a cause for uh, respiratory distress on a pulmonary basis. This is one of the few that has a relatively characteristic uh, plain film and should not be confused with many other lesions. In this patient, you see sort of coarse densities throughout the lungs as if you're looking at small areas of microatelectasis everywhere. This is classic for meconium aspiration. You can't tell in this particular patient, but that is a disease that is virtually confined to term babies. It's not seen in premature babies. It also is the one cardiac or pulmonary condition that we see where the clinical findings in the patient may not necessarily correlate with how bad the x-ray looks. You can have an x-ray that looks totally awful and the baby be relatively asymptomatic, mild tachypnea, mild oxygen requirement, or they can have very minimal changes in their lungs and be cyanotic with, with PO2s that are still in the 50s or 60s, even though they're on 100% oxygen. Uh, there's an underlying reason for that that I don't really need to go into now, now, but this is a very characteristic picture from meconium aspiration. I have rarely seen a neonatal pneumonia that looks like that, so it's a possibility. This is another example of meconium aspiration, probably one of the worst ones I've ever seen. Again, you, you see all these coarse nodular densities throughout the lungs. Usually they're most marked in the bases as expected, and this is classic for meconium aspiration, rarely an appearance for neonatal pneumonia. And although this patient was tachypnic and a little bit hypoxic, he wasn't as symptomatic as his x-ray would have uh, you'd imagine him to be. Okay, we've discussed the fairly common pulmonary causes for neonatal respiratory distress. Uh, as I said earlier, 
when it's a medical disorder, the lungs are usually going to be involved in a fairly symmetrical fashion. Then your only job is to decide, is it a primary pulmonary problem, as of the, as the previous four conditions I discussed, or is it cardiac? And there are several clues that may point you towards uh, congenital heart disease as the underlying cause for the patient's problem. One of them is if you have a heart that's too big or you have a heart that's too small. This is a patient that you might want to say this looks like hyaline membrane disease, but it really is more the pattern of severe interstitial infiltrates, severe interstitial pulmonary edema, because there aren't too many uh, inflammatory causes for interstitial infiltrates in a brand new baby that's less than an hour of age. So this is one of the few ant minis in congenital heart disease. When you see a severe interstitial pattern of pulmonary edema with a heart that's really relatively small, you always think of obstructed total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So a heart that's too small or a heart that's too big points to the fact that maybe you're dealing with congenital heart disease. Okay, here's a one, a one day old baby, or less than an hour probably. His heart is big. He does have some thymic tissue, but it's still a big heart. He looks like he's got pulmonary edema. Uh, again, if the heart is too big or too small, you always should think more about congenital heart disease. This happened to be a case of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and they can have a small heart, they can have a big heart, but they almost always have a pattern of perihilar or even more fulminant pulmonary edema. When you talk about congestive heart failure in a newborn in the first week of life, you also have to divide it into whether they're term or premature. The most common cause of congestive heart failure due to heart disease in the first week of life in a premature infant is simply a ductus arteriosus. And that's what we're dealing with here. Usually it's a baby that starts off with hyaline membrane disease and after a couple days or at the end of the first week they'll off, often open their ductus and give you this pattern of pulmonary edema uh, as the hyaline membrane disease has sort of melted away. Um, the most common cause for congestive heart failure due to heart disease in the term baby is hypoplastic left heart as I just showed you. You know, I have to throw in the caveat that in this day and age the role of the radiologist in the diagnosis of congenital, congenital heart disease is much less because uh, probably 95% of these babies, are, their actual cardiac lesion in detail is defined on the fetal ultrasound so that the radiologist's role is much less. but you will see these things on your board, so it's important just to get some of the general principles. And now here's the patient that obviously has a very, very big heart. You know, no matter how much thymus you think he has, down here you don't usually have thymic tissue. So he has marked cardiomegaly. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but the actually the 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 most important thing you need to evaluate in order to diagnose congenital heart disease and maybe categorize it is what does the pulmonary vascular pattern look like? And I'm talking about the pulmonary arterial flow and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, but obviously if you have a heart this big it's really hard to say what's going on with the vessels. But as a general rule, whenever you see a heart that's wall to wall like this, it's either some form of dilated cardiomyopathy or it's Epstein's malformation of the tricuspid valve. I don't intend to talk about specific entities in great detail, but just give you sort of ballpark things to look for. So this was Epstein's malformation of the tricuspid valve. And if you could assess the pulmonary arterial markings down here, they usually have decreased pulmonary blood flow. It is a right to left shunt, and they usually have severe central cyanosis. All right, I talked about you know, whether the heart is too big or too small, sometimes it's just an abnormal configuration. And this is your classic boot-shaped heart that you often see with Tetralogy of Fallot. This happens to be a patient that has esophageal atresia. She actually, I think, qualified for a, a Vodder or multiple anomaly syndrome. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call the pulmonary arterial markings decreased, and usually in tetralogy of flow, that doesn't usually happen this early in life. She's only a couple of days old. While I'm on this, I may as well discuss this with you. When I talk about looking at the pulmonary arterial markings and whether the arteries look too big or too small, you look down here, you don't look in the apices. All the vessels that you see in the bases are always going to be arteries. You don't see veins in the lung bases. 
they're hard enough to see in adults, and you're never going to see them in newborns or infants. So when I talk about assessing pulmonary blood flow, you look in the lung bases through the heart. You know, obviously, the, if it was a normal heart, it would be obscured, but you still can see the vessels through it. So this was Tetralogy of Fallot. This is another patient with Tetralogy of Fallot. That's a classic boot-shaped heart. To me, there are not normal vessels in the lung bases, so I would have read this as right ventricular hypertrophy with decreased pulmonary blood flow. And one of the most definite clues that you may be dealing with a patient, uh, with a patient that has congenital heart disease is whether or not they have a right aortic arch. And determining whether a patient has a right, or, right aortic arch is not as easy in a newborn. One of the best clues whether or not you have a right aortic arch is is the trachea deviated to the left. Most newborns, they have big heads, they're laying on their back, so when you x-ray them, their neck is flexed and the trachea buckles. Well, a normal trachea and a normal patient with a left aortic arch should buckle to the right. If you ever have a patient whose trachea buckles to the left, and I'm going to try and window this, I think you can see there's a slight bowing of the trachea to the left. That means he has to have have a, you actually can see the arch here, but you, you don't necessarily see the arch, but you will almost always see that deviation. And there's an extra clue in this patient. This is a, his umbilical artery catheter, and you can see it's progressing to the right of the spine, which means his descending aorta is on the right, and more often than not, whichever side of the spine the descending aorta is on, the arch will also be there. There are rare exceptions to that, but they're pretty uncommon. So right aortic arch, RVH, decreased blood flow, that's classic for tetralogy of Fallot. This is a, a one-day-old baby that's severely cyanotic, and he certainly has a big heart. And he also has what we would describe as a very narrow cardiac base. Part of that may be that his thymus is involuted, but whenever you see this configuration of a heart, and what looks like increased arterial markings. Again, these look like vessels down here, and they have to be arteries. So egg on a string type of heart with increased arterial flow is almost always going to be transposition of the great vessels, which is the most common cause for cyanotic heart disease with increased flow in a term baby in the first week of life. The only lesion that may look very similar to this is truncus arteriosus, uh, which can give you a similar egg on a string, cardiomegaly with increased arterial markings, but they're cyanotic. The only difference being that uh, tr truncus arteriosus has about a 40% incidence of right aortic arch, whereas simple transposition does not really have an increased incidence. So if you see this pattern with a right arch, it's a good bet you're dealing with persistent truncus arteriosus. Uh, but other than that, they can have a very similar plain film. This is a relatively unusual case in that the pulmonary arterial markings are asymmetrical. You definitely, if you look behind the heart, there is no, there are no pulmonary arteries near the size of what you see in the same area of the right lung. If you look at the whole left lung, the whole left lung looks more lucent than the right lung because it's underperfused. There's decreased arterial flow to the left lung. So the flow to the left lung is absolutely and relatively decreased. The flow to the right lung is absolutely as well as relatively increased. The classic thing to have considered here is, is what's called a hemitruncus, uh, where you have the right pulmonary artery arising from the truncus, therefore the increased flow, whereas the left pulmonary artery will be atretic. That is not what this turned out to be, although I was kind of, and if you'll notice, by the way, there is a right aortic arch. You see the trachea bowing to the left. What this patient actually had was pulmonary atresia with an intact ventricular septum. And typically, I'll show you a case in a second, typically that has symmetrical decrease flow, but the only reason why the right lung looks overperfused is because there was a very unusual, very dilated bronchial collateral that uh, reconstituted the flow to the right lung. Uh, so it's an unusual appearance for a simple case of pulmonary atresia, but that's the reason. But if you ever see a case like this again, you should always put your money on so-called hemitruncus. All right, this is a case of classic pulmonary atresia with out of VSD. The heart's big and the flow is down. You know, these lungs look a little black, not because 
the film is overexposed, they're black because the arterial markings are significantly diminished. Here, behind the heart, again, generally the vascular markings should be the same on both sides unless you have that asymmetric flow that I talked about. Uh, so this is pulmonary atresia with an intact ventricular septum. Just remember, if this was pulmonary atresia but with a VSD, they would look more like a tetralogy physiology with a heart that's not really that big. But whenever you don't have the VSD as a blow-off, uh, they get much more significant, uh, moderate to severe cardiomegaly. Okay, the last area in congenital heart disease is when there's a situs abnormality. You can clearly see this patient has dextrocardia. He looks like a pattern of severe interstitial pulmonary edema. If you'll notice, his stomach bubble is on the right side. So your first thought might be, well, he's got situs inversus totalis. But then if you look at the liver, if, you'll, if you have situs inversus, then that means that the left lobe of the liver should be the dominant lobe. If you notice in this patient, the right and left lobes of the liver are almost the same size. So this is what we call a midline liver. So that tells you you're dealing with a splenic malformation. Could be asplenia or polysplenia. That's a lesion you'll learn more about during your rotation. It's a very fascinating lesion. Uh, so whenever, whenever the abdominal viscera, uh, especially when the stomach bubble and cardiac apex are on the right or on opposite sides, you should always consider the possibility of a splenic malformation. And there's at least an 80% incidence of some form of congenital heart disease when you're, whenever you have polysplenia or asplenia. There's another patient that has a situs abnormality. You can see the cardiac apex is on the right, but the stomach bubble is staying on the left. You can say, well, he's just got dextrocardia with visceral situs solitus. And that might be true except for the fact, again, both the right and left lobes of the liver are the same size. Uh, usually when you have a left-sided stomach and you have situs solitus, then the right lobe of the liver should be much bigger than that. So this is another splenic malformation. I don't remember particularly what his cardiac lesion was, but he did have congenital heart disease. Okay, this is the last uh, case of a, of a situs abnormality I wanted to show you, but this is something that you should remember because this is pretty much a 95 to 100% rule. Whenever the cardiac apex is on the left, and the stomach bubbles on the right, you probably don't have a case of levocardia and visceral situs inversus. You probably almost always are going to have a splenic malformation. That's not true of dextrocardia and left sided stomach. They may simply have dextrocardia and visceral situs solitus. But whenever you see the apex on the left and the stomach on the right, they almost always will have a splenic malformation. And it's confirmed in this case, because again, if you have a right sided stomach, then the left lobe of the liver should be much bigger than that. So this is also pretty much a midline liver. Uh, especially polysplenia often has this, this combination of levocardia and a right-sided stomach. Look real carefully, you'll notice that, <clears throat> that they do have a midline liver.